Aloha and welcome to the 14th installment of the Pythagorean Order of Death podcast or the POD podcast. Uh, I, as always, am your host, uh, Jonathan Reverend, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G. Uh, tonight I'll be uh, reading an interview uh, between myself and uh, Andrus Lux on the uh, Pythagorean Order of Death material itself. Uh, it'll be the second installment of this uh, series to cover this uh, span of uh, genre of topics. And uh, the second such interview between uh, Andrews asking questions and myself providing answers based on the POD material. So uh, without any further hoopla and ado, let's uh, let's dive right into his questions. What is the heaven dimension of Atlantean democracy? So let us begin by combining the many worlds hypothesis with modern string theory. According to string theory, the three and a half dimensions we know of in our local universe are only those that expanded out of a potentially infinite possible sum of such. Modern string theory tends to limit the number of dimensions in our neighboring multiverse to somewhere around 10 or 11 such that our local universe has three, two neighboring universes also have three, and all three of these universes share the same direction of time as well. Hence, our own three, plus three of a parallel dimensional universe to our own, plus another three of another parallel dimensional universe, and then added on top of all these nine of these dimensions, our own local three, and the three of each of our two neighbors, the singular direction, one half of a dimension, of time as a unifying force to connect them all. Now, if we can describe the relationship of these neighboring universes as being parallel along the same timeline to our own, then we can describe them as being potentially either ahead of and behind our own in time, or else one on either side of us, all side by side existing at the same time, or else one above and one below, where there would be a comparably better universe above us and a comparably worse universe below. Now, if the universes are ahead of and behind us in time, we can define them as like a future, the leading, and past, the lagging universe, still theoretically comparable to our own. If these neighboring universes occur at the same rate as our own local universe, then they may be parallel alongside our own, but no more or less advanced than our own, so differences between them may be difficult to discern. If these yet hypothetical neighboring universes are situated so that one is above and the other is below our own, then significant differences may begin to become apparent. The better universe above our own and the worse universe below would constitute a heaven and hell dimension comparable to our own middle way universe between them. The most likely scenario in reality is that black holes inside our local universe, our local universe itself, and the mass equivalent of hyperspace surrounding our local universe are all nearly equal in volume and gravitational pull on one another, and that it is these, therefore, that constitute the lesser and greater dimensional neighboring universes inside and outside our own. However, if one can measure luck, the capacity for life to survive, 
as applying to a local portion of space-time, such as to here on Earth now, one can still consider the model of a better and worse possible future timeline, similarly to the model of a neighboring universe above and below. So, for example, a better possible future timeline for an individual would improve their personal luck, and so a worse possible future timeline for an individual would deplete their personal luck. Just so, a better possible future timeline for any group would lead to a utopia and a worse possible future timeline to a dystopia. Therefore, given all these conditions, it is the premise of the Pythagorean order of death that the utopia that can exist in the better possible future timeline for all life on Earth may be defined as Atlantean democracy in the relative short term, the next century or so, while the parallel, worse, possible future timeline leads to a global dictatorship in that same span of time. Anderson's second question. <clears throat> what is the POD's understanding of the global government agenda or new world order? The desire to rule the world is an extremely ancient urge among a very small percentage of the human species. Sargon of Akkad, Alexander the Macedonian, Julius Caesar of Rome, Genghis Khan of the Mongol steppes, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, and German Fuhrer Adolf Hitler are some of the examples most commonly given but they are hardly alone among a list of all the conquerors who sought to expand their own property's borders. So, for those with eyes to see, the trend toward a single worldwide empire has been obvious for literally thousands of years. The revelation of St. John of Patmos, 13 verses 16 through 18, describes a global dictatorship predicted to occur during the end times leading up to Judgment Day by saying, quote, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. End quote. This verse may have inspired the later rituals of the York Rite Freemasonry, or the verse itself may have been inspired by the ancient Solomonic labor union practices emulated in the later Masonic rituals. Either way, in the ritual of the Mark Master Mason, the first degree of the York Rite, Following the initial three of the Blue Lodge, the candidate is shown the potential punishment for someone who did not present their proper Mason's Mark in exchange for their daily wages. In this context, the Mason's Mark is further associated with the lost word of Freemasonry, supposedly tantamount to the lost name of the monotheist religion's god. Espousing works such as Thomas More's Fort, such as Thomas More's 1516 Utopia, and Sir Francis Bacon's 1626 New Atlantis, most of the founders of the United States Federal Government of America were Freemasons, and they constructed Washington D.C. as a geometrically mirrored model of the heavens. When papal infallibility was declared by Pope Pius IX in the 1870 document ratified by the First Vatican Council, 
called Pastor Eternus. It was merely an admission of what had always been doctrine inside the Roman Catholic Church throughout the entirety of the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Conquistador eras. The Pope is above the law to such an extent that if a Pope declares a thing so, it simply is. For example, the papal bull issued by Pope Clement XII in 1738, entitled In Eminenti, which declared joining or belonging to, quote, certain societies, companies, assemblies, meetings, congregations, or convecticles called in the popular tongue Liberi Miratori or Francs Maisons, end quote, an excommunication worthy offense for Catholics, with that bull serving as an interdiction, making it anathema to provide communion to any Freemason. Some may argue this papal bull was issued to stave off the then rising infiltration of Masonic lodges by staunch Illuminati sectarians on one hand and by reckless Hellfire Club libertines on the other. However, as the bull itself states of all secret society members in general, quote, if they were not doing evil, they would not have so great a hatred of the light. End quote. Much of 20th century geopolitical history has been forwarded by Bolshevik ideolo ideologies infiltrating Freemasonry and being conflated with the Hebrew blood libel myth by old world anti Semitism. Once Freemasonry had become a truly global network, it became a de facto secular New World Order in direct or indirect competition with the elder empire of Catholicism for rule over the unified planet Earth. So, from the conservative Catholic point of view, Freemasonry historically harbors radicalized liberalism, while from a Masonic point of view, Catholicism has become or always was, a spiritual dictatorship under the autocratic rule of the Vatican papacy. Neither is ideal. Can you explain Crowley's eight lectures on yoga? In a word, no. What are the Atlantean alphabet letters, and are they the same as J.B. Rhine's cards? Yes, the five letters of the Atlantean alphabet of unspoken telepathic communication are a direct pilfer of the Zener cards used by Psy researchers Carl Zener and J.B. Rhine, developed in the 1930s. The premise is that these symbols leaked into the collective unconsciousness to such a level they bled back through time to the earliest ideations of mankind. There may be some justification made for this, considering the basic geometry and symbolism of these shapes in themselves when compared to petroglyphs from various ancient cultures. The basic shapes on the Zener cards are, as described by Wikipedia, quote, a hollow circle, a plus sign, three vertical wavy lines, a hollow square, and a hollow five-pointed star, end quote. So in the context of the Atlantean alphabet, we give these letters certain names associated with arcane and bygone times. The hollow circle we call Om. The plus sign we call Thule. The three vertical wavy lines, or rivers, we call Chi. 
the hollow square we call Tao, and the hollow pentagram we call Vril. The Atlantean alphabet concept introduced early in the POD omnibus plays a far more important role later on in the constitutions of the Pope, where it is associated with both the positions of the chief executives during certain key pivotal rituals and with cer- sacred music theory. Can you explain the 10 Shining Spark Sephiroth and how the recombinations work? According to the Sefer Yetzirah, 32 mystical paths of wisdom came into existence. 10 were the Sephiroth, emanations of nothingness, and the others, 22 paths, the tarot trumps, between them. The emanations of the greater light shone directly outward toward the viewer, while the paths emanate like beams or rays of light connecting from one Sephiroth to the next. The whole model is often presented as merely a mnemonic for improving memory, but originally the Sephiroth traits described attribute uh, attribute traits of the one true God and the shape of the tree of life these Sephiroth and paths formed was thought to be like his very body itself or at the very least like the DNA of time. The original names of the ten Sephiroth given in Hebrew and descending from the top down are Kether, Chakma, Benah, Chesed, Gevara, Tifereth, Netzach, Had, Yesod, and Malkuth. These terms mean, in ascending order and English translation, the kingdom, the foundation, the splendor, the victory, the beauty, the courage, the mercy, the understanding, the wisdom, and the crown. The 22 paths between these attribute traits, then, take the form of the Hebrew alphabet, their alchemical and astrological equivalencies, and the tarot trumps. So, nowadays, we describe these this way, listing the 22 paths as the numbered trumps beginning with zero and ending with 21. Zero, the fool is crowned in wisdom. One, the magus is crowned in understanding. Two, the high priestess is crowned in beauty. Three, the empress is she whose understanding equals wisdom. Four, the emperor is he whose wisdom is beauty. Five, the pope is he whose wisdom is mercy. The lovers, six, whose understanding is beauty. Seven, the chariot, whose understanding is severity. Eight, strength, whose severity is mercy. Nine, the hermit, whose mercy is beauty. Ten, the wheel of fortune, whose mercy is victory. Eleven, justice, whose severity is beauty. Twelve, the hanged man, whose severity is splendor. Thirteen, death, whose beauty is victory. Fourteen, temperance, whose beauty is the foundation. 15. The Devil, whose beauty is splendor. 16. The Tower, whose victory is splendor. 17. The Star, whose victory is the foundation. 18. The Moon, whose victory is the kingdom. 
19, the sun, whose splendor is the foundation. 20, judgment, whose splendor is the kingdom. And 21, the world, whose foundation is the kingdom. Of course, as any student of these subjects knows, there are many formulaic models, each with its own school of adherence. As the middle pillar of the tree of life design has slipped down over the ages, it has opened up the debate about an 11th non sephirot of death, meaning knowledge, but essentially cognate to gnosis or inspired revelation that may or may not occupy the veil of the abyss between chesed, mercy, and binah, understanding. Therefore, nowadays, much of the original intention of Kabbalah is lost. I have to have a sip of water. I'm clearly losing my voice just a little bit. Hopefully I can stave it off and not lose it more. So that's my plug for water. What is your Jacob's Ladder arrangement about, and how does it relate to EM Fields? <clears throat> the arrangement I call the Jacob's Ladder is a combination of the geometrical lattice shapes of the Tree of Life of a Kabbalah and the Tree of Death of the Cliffoth. Insofar as the tree of life is thought of as being like the Kab, Egyptian for body, of Allah, the Arabic name of God, it may be seen, as I mentioned earlier here also, as being like the DNA of time itself. Likewise, the tree of death of the modern Cliffoth may relate to the next phase of human evolution represented by a tetrahelix model of DNA. Just so, uh, so just as the key to immortality may be implied as a modified triple helix spiral structure, the key to unlocking the full potential of time itself may be a quadrupole or quaternion, quaternion genome literally the metaform DNA of God. Thus, combining these two models, the tree of life, expressing the DNA of time, and the tree of death, expressing immortal triple helix DNA, into the Jacob's Ladder array, yields a lattice shape graphing the seven chakras along the central pillar, and the ten sephirah of nothingness, of Hakabalah as the twin pillars of Jakin and Boaz to either side of these. The elegant combination of the original geometric lattices, the trees of life and death, into a new model, the Jacob's Ladder, and the fact this new model spontaneously conforms to an existing number base system, the seven chakras seem to indicate the relationships of traits on this lattice are an authentic discovery rather than being an intentional invention or statistical coincidence. To some, this may even imply divine design. In the POD literature, what is your understanding of the seven chakra nerve centers? Firstly, the seven chakras of the Vedic, Hindu, Buddhist tradition in the Orient do correspond to the five nerve plexuses along the spine, 
to the thalami and pineal gland inside the brain. The root chakra, called muladhara, corresponds to what neuroanatomists today call the pair of coccygeal CO1 nerves. The sacral chakra, svadhisthana, corresponds today to the five sacral nerve pairs. The navel chakra, manipura, corresponds to the five lumbar nerve pairs. The heart chakra, anahata, corresponds to the 12 thoracic nerve pairs. The throat chakra, vishuddha, corresponds to the eight pairs of cervical nerves. The third eye chakra, the ajna, corresponds to the left and right thalami located just posterior to the frontal lobes of the cerebrum. And the crown chakra, Sahasarara, corresponds to the paired pineal and pituitary glands located below the corpus callosum in the middle of the brain. Based on my own understanding, and thus included in my contribution to the POD material, these seven chakra nerve centers known of in the Orient correspond to the so-called seven classical planets of antiquity in the Occident as being like antennae that have evolved to tune into the microgravitational tides caused by our five local planets, moon, and sun. Just so, the root chakra, Muladhara, is attuned to the planet Saturn. The sacral chakra, Svadhisthana, is attuned to the planet Jupiter. The navel chakra, Manipura, is attuned to the planet Mars. The heart chakra, Anahata, is attuned to the sun. The throat chakra, Vishuddha, is attuned to the planet Venus. The third eye chakra, Ajna, is attuned to the planet Mercury. And the crown chakra, Sahasrara, is attuned to the Earth's moon. The order of the classical planets in this system derives from the Kamiya magic number squares of antiquity given by Henry Cornelius Agrippa in chapter 22, book 2 of his three-volume 1531 opus on occult philosophy. In this system, Saturn is associated with the smallest number square of three by three or nine cells with a magic number sum of 15. Jupiter is associated with the next larger square of 4 by 4, or 16 cells, with a magic number equaling 34. The square of Mars is 5 by 5, or 25 cells, and has a magic number sum of 65. The square of the sun is 6 by 6, or 36 cells, and it has a magic number sum of 111. The square of Venus is 7 by 7, or 49 cells, with a magic sum of 175. The square of Mercury is 8 by 8, or 64 cells, and has a magic number sum of 260 and the square of the moon is 9 by 9, or 81 cells, with a magic number sum of 369. Just so, a heptagon, with each point labeled in this order, by the scale of the associated Kamiya magic number square, corresponds to a heptagram, with each stellation labeled in the order of the seven days of the week. Thus, 
the sun to Sunday, the moon to Monday, Mars to Saturday, Mercury to Wednesday, Jupiter to Thursday, Venus to Friday, and Saturn to Saturday. Taking the sigils, or signatures of the seven archangels given by Francis Barrett in his 1801 The Magus, and associating them with the seven days of the week as therein, we find that Michael rules Sunday, Gabriel rules Monday, Camiel rules Tuesday, Raphael rules Wednesday, Satchiel rules Thursday, Aniel rules Friday, and Cassiel rules Saturday. As attributed in Amulets and Talismans by E. A. Wallace Budge, the seven sigils given by Barrett for the Archangels can also be placed onto the camia or seals of the seven Olympic dignitaries such that the Olympic Eratron corresponds to Saturn, to the 3 by 3 magic number square, to Saturday, and to the Archangel Cassiel. The Olympic Bethor relates to Jupiter, the 4 by 4 square, the day Thursday, and Archangel Satchiel, Olympic Phaleg, to Mars, the five by five square, Tuesday in the week, and to the Archangel Camiel. Olympic Ock is equal to the Sun, the six by six square, Sunday, and Michael. The Olympic Hagith corresponds to Venus, to the 7 by 7 square, to Friday in the week, and thus to Archangel Aniel. Olympic Ophiel, to Mercury, the 8 by 8 square, to Wednesday, and to Archangel Raphael. And the Olympic dignitary Fool corresponds to the Moon, the 9 by 9 cell magic number square, to the day of the week Monday, and to the Archangel Gabriel. The POD material goes much further with these lines of research as well, corresponding these also to the eight kings in five cities of the antediluvian section of the Sumerian king list, but it seems like this should be sufficient to answer the question in brief. Oh. <clears throat> what is the morphogenetic field and how does it relate to our aura the aura or the electromagnetic energy field of a living being's body is evidence while the body is alive for the premise of a soul or mental energy being that can survive after the death of its biological body. Although its exact form varies over time, the symbolic depiction of the average shape over a whole lifetime of the aura is a torus, most specifically a hypersphere surrounding a spiral that connects the top pole to its opposite, along seven twists or smaller spheres, the seven chakras. Traditionally, the pattern of flow of energy in this toroidal aura has been better understood than the nature of the energy comprising it. For example, chi or psi exists within the aura and outside of it these being expressions for the zero-point energy field of hyperspace. 
while the aura itself is comprised of karma, good and evil, that somehow divides this energy force outside from inside itself, like a soap bubble full of air, clear or smoky, floating in the same medium it contains. The direction karma, or chi, flows on the surface of the toroidal aura itself appears to be from top to bottom and around the outside downward, and then from bottom to top along the central spiral upward. Even this appearance may be deceptive, however, since it may only look this way from the outside while seeming the opposite from the inside looking out. In any event, the upward, inward flow of this esoteric energy force is associated with kundalini in yoga, the inner fire snake that may be aroused through the various yogic practices. Kundalini in the Orient is thought to also be cognate to the concept of the Mayan Quetzalcoatl or Aztec Kukulkan, the feathered serpent deity of the Yucatan and Mesoamerica. Now, if the aura can thus be likened to the soul, then the morphogenetic field may be likened to the spirit. It is said there may be many souls for only one spirit or Holy Ghost because the souls are the unique material molds made of, from the spirit as a singular ideal form. This is to say, the patterns of the aura's energy for each individual may be unique to them during their lifetime, but if averaged over time, they conform to the shape of a torus field overall. Thus, each soul or aura is unique and individual, but the toroidal-shaped template of the soul or aura, that is, their spirit, is the same for all. So it can be reasoned that the morphogenetic field or spirit as an archetypal template defining the symbolically toroidal form of the soul is to the esoteric energy of ZPE, like the Higgs boson is for matter with mass. The modernly called Higgs boson is itself, is, it is said, what gives matter its mass. The Higgs boson is a quantum, or more exactly a specific kind of spin that gives mass to all things. To give means to bestow and to allow. Thus, the Higgs boson acts to constrain all matter to having its certain mass and disallows it from having any other. Just so, in string theory, it is hypothesized that the Big Bang event allowed only three spatial dimensions to expand out of 11 possible. Thus, some force acted to conserve or constrain this expansion. Such is the spirit to the soul and the morphogenetic field to the aura. Anders' final question is, why is it important to study Hakabalah today. Hakabalah provides a geometric lattice, the tree of life diagram, for applying metaphysical concepts to it, the traits and attributes of God in the classical case, for the purpose of studying their relationships. This model allows otherwise less easily perceived insights about these metaphysical concepts to be attained and explained. 
In this way, the tree of life is like a template for the entire manifold of models describing similar relationships between other metaphysical concepts that can be said to, in whole, comprise a Kabbalah. If taken in this liberal sense of Kabbalah being an organically growing, living field of study, then all the modern breakthroughs made using these methods of graphically relating variable traits may be attributed to it, e.g. cybernetics and system theory in whole, being derived specifically from the intentional engineering of machines to defeat difficult cryptography. As we stand now at the brink of ideas like a quantum internet and faster-than-light encryption systems, it is not accidental that the study of the Kabbalah has become worldwide and can no longer be seen as confined solely to Hasidic Hebrews. One anti-Semitic theory that has persisted about Kabbalists, and in particular the Hasidic Hebrews, states that Hakabalah is used as a method of mass mind control to suppress the mental development of the masses and allow the rule of the inbred class of monarchs. In defense against this argument, the vast publicity of the Kabbalah at present provides ample evidence for the effects of studying the Kabbalah on a mass scale. Some outcomes are greatly positive, and some may be more negative, but the vast majority remain entirely benign. As Buddha put it, a fool, even if associating with a sage for a whole lifetime, will no more perceive the Dharma than a spoon perceives the taste of soup. If one perceives a Kabbalah as evil, one will likely be biased against studying it. But if one studies a Kabbalah, one will likely cease to perceive doing so as evil. Thus, claims made against the study of the Kabbalah are made in ignorance, and claims made in favor of studying a Kabbalah are usually based on personal, self-serving bias as well. Nevertheless, a Kabbalah exists regardless of whether it is suited whether it is studied or ignored and to this extent it is superior to even the idea of god itself which is everywhere known of and widely believed but without material evidence and logically false the kabbalah exists it describes a higher dimension of reality defined by metaphysics and the relationships between its variable terms. Study of Hakabalah holds a key to unlocking a more complete understanding of a higher dimension of maths, physics, and sciences in general. In a sense, Hakabalah is the key to the future of human evolution. And such were Anders's nine questions for the 14th POD podcast, uh, the second installment of a uh, specifically Pythagorean order of death themed question and answer session. Uh, as always, I've been your host and will always be your host, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G. Uh, and as always, I hope that this message and signal finds you well and in good health and happy spirits. And uh, to that end, all I can say for now is good night. And I hope you're all having one as well. Uh, peace. <laughs>